Thanks, Joanne. Thanks so much. If we were to think about the biggest problems affecting our world, any socially conscious person would have to include poverty, disease, and climate change. And yet there is one thing that causes all three of these simultaneously, that we pay almost no attention to, even though a very good solution exists. It's one of the most unreported stories about life in the developing world, and I'm here to tell you about it. In 2005, I was working with a rural community development NGO in Osmanabad, India. As part of my work, I conducted in-depth interviews with women in their homes. I interviewed Meena in a village called Bamaniwadi. At the time, she was cooking lunch for her husband and her two-year-old daughter, who was crawling next to her as she cooked. Like most women in the village, Meena was cooking on an indoor open fire. Her one-room hut was thick with smoke. By 30 minutes into the two-hour interview, everyone's eyes were watering, we were coughing, and I could barely breathe. I was horrified when I realized that Mina and her family have to deal with this on a daily basis. Yet this is how nearly half the world lives. Three billion people cook their meals on an indoor open fire. When we think about the biggest killers of people living in poverty in the developing world, we think about AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. We don't think about the kitchen. Yet every year, two million people die from indoor air pollution from cooking on an open fire. It's like wiping out the entire population of Montreal every year. Indoor air pollution kills more people than AIDS. How does this happen? Day after day, for up to six hours a day, women like Mina cook their food on an open fire. And when they do, they and their children breathe in the toxic smoke from the flames, which gets into their lungs and leads to fatal respiratory diseases. Half of these two million deaths are children under the age of five. It's the equivalent of those young children being forced to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. The biggest killer globally of young children is smoke from the open fire. So there's this serious problem which kills more people than AIDS, and yet we're completely ignoring it. In addition, cooking on an open fire is, is a huge cause of climate change. Smoke from the open fire contains something called black carbon, which is the second biggest contributor to climate change. According to the latest figures on black carbon, cooking on an open fire contributes more black carbon to the atmosphere than all of the cars and the trucks in the world combined. So here's the situation. We have three billion people who cook their meals on an open fire with devastating health and climate consequences. Solving this problem would have a huge impact on global health and, and climate change. And there is a solution. The production and distribution of ultra-clean cookstoves. Cookstoves that nearly completely eliminate smoke and reduce fuel consumption. I work with a group that has developed an ultra-clean cook stove that reduces smoke and black carbon by nearly 95% and cuts fuel consumption by nearly 50%. So how does the stove work? The user feeds local fuels, whether it's wood, cow dung, or crop residue, through the side of the, of the stove. Then they light the flame much as they would their open fire. But the heat from the flame is converted through a tiny thermoelectric generator into electricity. The electricity generated powers an internal fan, which force feeds oxygen onto the flame, eliminating the smoke 
and leading to the near complete and clean combustion of the fuel. It gets better. The stove generates surplus electricity, enough surplus electricity to charge a mobile phone and provide an evening's worth of light. At an estimated retail price of $40, there's enough savings in fuel and electricity that the stove can pay for itself in seven months. And it gets even better. Because the stove reduces black carbon, we can take advantage of existing carbon credit offset programs from Europe, which will allow us to make this stove affordable to the poorest of the poor. You may wonder why I'm telling you all this. I'm not an engineer. I didn't design the stove. I'm just a guy from Cleveland, Ohio, who has trouble making a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> but after my experience in hundreds of smoky homes across rural India, I set myself the goal of trying to figure out how to solve this problem. So I helped the NGO that I was working with to build a distribution channel to retail cook stoves to Mina and her neighbors. We distributed a stove marketed by a large British oil company, but it had some problems. It used an expensive fuel pellet, which people didn't want to pay for, and it required electricity, which many villages didn't have. So it sucked. <laughs> and understanding why it sucked was my PhD thesis in management studies from Oxford. <laughs> what this big oil company didn't understand was how people in rural India interact with their cooking environment. They didn't think about the significance of the cook stove in daily life. What I saw in the months and months that I spent in rural India was that for technology to work, it needs to be locally appropriate. And it's not just this big oil company that got it wrong. So many previous attempts at improving the lives of people living in poverty have failed. And I came to realize that many of those failures did not employ a user-centered approach. They failed to take into account how real people live, their real behaviors, and cultural preferences. So how to crack the problem of cook stoves? When I really thought about the time that I had spent with those people in the villages in rural India, I realized that the stove was not just an appliance, but the spiritual center of their home. They saw this fire in their kitchen as a domestic god, a deity, and the flame as a spiritual messenger between them and heaven. They prayed before the stove every day, and created rangoli, artwork they drew around the stove with colorful chalk to consecrate it, to make it a sacred object. In much of the developing world, the wife does the cooking, and she and the children suffer the health effects, but the husband controls the money. So how could we convince both the wife and the husband to purchase a cook stove? Most men in rural India have a mobile phone, which is essential to helping them improve their living. Yet many men can't charge the phone at home because they don't have electricity. Usually there's a commercial kiosk in a village, in a larger village several miles away, where they have to pay to charge their phone. In Kenya, people pay three to four dollars a month to charge their phone. That's two days' salary. That's seven percent of their income just to charge their phone. But since our stove generates electricity, more than enough electricity to charge their phone, men are going to like this stove. <laughs> there are also some design considerations. People in different regions cook different dishes. In Guatemala, they make tortillas, so they need a big cooking surface. In Ghana, they stir large pots of stew so they need a sturdy stove that won't topple. In North India, they cook flatbreads, which require a very hot flame. 
So we're going to have to customize our stove for different cultures. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ethan, what about a solar cooker? Wouldn't that be a good idea? The problem is, the taste of food is a cultural tradition. Traditional cultures are accustomed to cooking over an open fire. Solar cooked food would taste different. It's like telling us to microwave a steak. Also, a solar stove might be a problem during the monsoon season, which can last for several months. And sometimes, people feel like cooking at night. So how do we get these stoves to people? Why don't we just get a billion dollars from Warren Buffett or Mitt Romney <laughs> and throw millions of these stoves at rural India? It's not a good idea. People don't want charity. The people in rural India, just like you and me, want their cherished objects to be the result of their effort and their economic achievements. Also, if we give the stoves away and they break down and people can't fix them, they're going to go back to cooking over the open fire. In fact, in the early 1980s, the government of India developed a cook stove made of mud that they distributed practically free of charge to over 30 million rural homes. The mud cook stove reduced fuel consumption by 25%. But it was ugly, and it broke down, and nobody liked it, and they went back to cooking over an open fire. This is a classic case in international development where good intentions have unintended consequences. Over and over again, I've seen goods and services being given away practically free of cost when people in the village would have been willing to pay for them. This does two things. One, it creates a culture of dependence. Two, it suppresses potential economic activity where others in the village would have been willing to provide these goods or services but get squeezed out by organizations giving stuff away for free. So how do we market these stoves in a locally appropriate way? Traditional cultures have hierarchies. In order to be effective in traditional cultures, we have to respect those hierarchies. We can't pretend they don't exist. And we can't try to upend them. That's why it's important to get the village leaders on board. They need to be the first to see the stove and use the stove. Their neighbors will be amazed that the stove can cook their food, charge their cell phone, and provide enough light for their children to do their homework at night. Through carbon credits and government subsidies, we can provide the stove at a price that's low enough to be affordable, but high enough to generate pride of ownership. To the villagers, this stove will be an aspirational product, the way the latest iPhone is an aspirational product for you or me. And although it may not be as immediately compelling a feature as charging a phone or providing light, ultimately, these cook stoves will save their lives. We will market these stoves through an ambitious person of, within the village. It will not be an outside agent coming in to tell people how they should live differently. It could be the village leader who markets the stove. In rural India, Every second year, the village leader is a woman. Past commercial projects have taught us that rural women can be excellent purveyors and distributors of essential products. This stove could generate an improved livelihood opportunity for thousands of rural women. Around 1440, Johannes Gutenberg, an entrepreneur with a great beard, set out to develop a printing press. At the time, scribes wrote books by hand. Yet the challenge of inventing printing was daunting. Civilizations had been trying for thousands of years to mechanically reproduce texts. The Minoans, the Greeks, the Chinese. Yet it never took off. In each case, there was something missing that was crucial to mass uptake, whether it was the invention of paper or 
the alphabet or expanded literacy or buy-in from religious elites. It wasn't just a technology problem. For printing to take off, all of these technical and cultural and social elements needed to align. Gutenberg understood the need to develop a contextually appropriate solution. For instance, he designed his typeface to look like scribal handwriting so that it was consistent with the look of valuable illuminated manuscripts. He didn't want to break with existing culture or else he'd alienate prospective buyers. Also, since the church controlled the book industry, he, just like us with cook stoves, needed to get the religious leaders on board. He made his first product the Bible, which as we know, went viral. <laughs> this was one of the most important inventions in world history because it led to the explosion of knowledge. But it only took off because it was consistent with the social, cultural, and religious context. Today, as in Gutenberg's time, in order to design solutions for any community, particularly in the developing world, it's important to develop an in-depth understanding of local users and their motivations. It's important to design solutions with the way people really live, with their culture and their beliefs. If we do this intelligently, we can solve some of the world's most serious problems. This is the BioLite home stove. I'm 30. By the time I'm 40, let's make sure there are millions and millions of these stoves saving lives across rural India and Africa. Thank you.